Immigration is a very controversial issue in the United States right now, as you well know. Um, but I think all too often people focus on things that just aren't fundamentally a problem with immigration. I do think there are valid concerns people have, or at least legitimate areas for debate. But I don't think those are the ones that are part of the popular discourse for the most part. Um, the ones that, actually, let me ask you, what are the prime objections that you hear to having more open immigration in the United States? Taking jobs. Oh, that's the South Park one. They take our jobs, right? Yeah. Once it makes, this is like the litmus test. Once it makes South Park, then it's cool. <laughs> everyone knows it. So they take our jobs, OK? What they else? They take our money. They take our money. So they make our wages lower, or they hurt our economy. Those seem to be like the three big ones I hear all the time. There's other ones, too, no doubt. Um, but those three seem to be the ones that dominate. But there's little economic basis for any of them. This doesn't mean that economists aren't critical of immigration. A great number of economists are critical of having more open immigration. But the reasons they're critical have nothing to do with hurting our economy, taking jobs, or lowering wages. Um, it's usually other reasons. So what I'd like to start by doing is going through the kind of uh, consensus economics on these fundamental parts of immigration. And then from there, go to consider reform, some of the other laws that have been passed, how it mixes with the welfare state, what the optimal quantity of immigrants is, things like that. Um, but let's start with the economy. So overall on the economy, economists across the board agree that immigrants are a net benefit to the economy. So George Borjas is probably the most prominent economist who's critical of immigration. Uh, but even his estimates put at a, po at a positive of what they have for their overall effect on our economy. Uh, using his method and updating it to the latest numbers puts you at a number of around $40 billion benefit to the United States. Um, which, $40 billion, cool, but in a $13, $14 trillion economy, it's pretty small as a percentage. Now, there's a number of reasons that that number is as small as it is. One is we have quantitative restrictions on the number of immigrants who could come in, so we don't get as much as we could. Two, the type of restrictions we have changes the mix of immigrants that we get. So we could get more out of them if we let in people with maybe different skill sets. Um, and three, actually, his method maybe isn't the best one for calculating it. Uh, but even when we switch to other people's methods of calculating it, uh, you're in the hundreds of billions range. You're not in the trillions range. So still as a percent of our economy, rather modest. Uh, so people aren't who say, you know, immigration makes our whole economy work. Not really. It's relatively modest as a percent of it. But economists across the board universally agree it is positive. They're not a drain on our economy. Um, the next thing that will come up then is the, the South Park one. That's my favorite. They steal our jobs. There is no evidence for this whatsoever. Let's just think for a second. What has happened to the US labor force since 1950? Yeah. They've all turned into Hispanic people. No, they haven't all turned into Hispanic people. We don't like morph. I'm not like, oh, am I going to turn into Hispanic tomorrow? Uh, <laughs> what's happened to the labor force in the United States since 1950? Yeah. It's transitioned from uh, in industrial slash agricultural economy to a more technological economy. Okay, so that's true. Economy. I'm asking more about what's happened to the labor force, the size and composition of the labor force. Yeah. Pretty much just a bunch of people got lazy. <laughs> I'm not sure. Thank you. The labor force has grown. And has grown is an understatement. So what do we have? Massive entry of baby boomers into the workforce. Women, who used to stay at home a lot more, disproportionately now come into the workforce. Post-1965, lots of immigrants come in. Roughly the size of the civilian labor force doubles from 1950 to today. If we had like a fixed pool of jobs and we doubled the number of workers, shouldn't we see like massive structural unemployment? We don't. We still see unemployment in like right now in a business cycle. So unemployment happens. But there's no like long-term trend of we've added more people, they took some of the jobs, and then now there's not jobs for somebody else. There's not a fixed pool of jobs. As we add more people, we add more jobs. You might displace a particular worker, but then they get reemployed in some new job that's created. So there's no like net contraction. In fact, if I charted like the size of the civilian labor force, if I had PowerPoint, I'd put this one up and the uh, total civilian employment, the two of them just bang, almost a 45 degree line that you get going from 1950 to today. Little difference between the two, that's unemployment, and there's blips for business cycle, but the two of them trail each other together pretty well. Uh, as you expand this labor force, you just expand the number of jobs. Um, there's some reasons for this. Um, one, 
the immigrants sometimes take the jobs that would have disappeared had it not been for immigration. So roughly a third of all garment workers in the United States are immigrants here. That's an industry that increasingly is becoming outsourced overseas into sweatshop style jobs. Uh, but some of them remain here because they're able to get immigrants more cheaply than they could get native-born labor to take the job. Yeah? Another reason is as you add more people into the economy, you also add more, a certain percentage of them will be employers rather than employees. OK, so some of them might come here and immigrants start their own businesses. Right. Sure, that's part of it. Uh, other parts of outsourcing, so it's not just low-skill jobs that they prevent from being outsourced, but Bill Gates has said if he could get more skilled people in, I know what they call the H-1V visa program, the United States had out, outsourced fewer jobs to India. So in many cases, the jobs simply wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the immigrants coming in. Um, there's a popular like bias in this, and it's a classic case of what Bastiat would call the seen and the unseen. When someone loses their job to an immigrant, it's very easy to like put the camera on them and be like, this guy lost his job to immigrants. OK, cool. But those immigrants, when they come here, they demand goods and services, and it creates jobs somewhere else. But it's not, there's lots of reasons jobs are created and lost. While it's identifiable when you can show somebody who lost their job to immigration, it's a lot harder to find where was the job created in the economy specifically because an immigrant came here. That, you can't stick the TV camera on. As a result, I think there's a popular bias in the thinking in this. So sometimes then, when you have immigration restrictions, what we see is instead of the job going to a native-born person, the job just ceases to exist. So a few years back, Arizona, the lettuce crop, uh, they couldn't get enough migrant workers in to harvest it. They took billions of dollars of losses and left a third of the crop in the ground to rot. They could have bid up the price of American labor to do it. So it's fashionable for some people to say, immigrants do the jobs Americans won't do. And then I think critics are correct when they respond. Yeah, they won't do them at those wages, but if their wages were higher, they would have done them. But the answer to that is, the job might not exist if the wages had to be higher. So like, why did the lettuce farmers leave the cro crops in the ground to rot? Because to bid up the price of labor high enough to get it out, they would have taken even bigger losses. So it made no sense to harvest it. That's going on right now in Georgia. Uh, so Georgia passed it up one of this, is one of the states that passed a tougher immigration enforcement law, um, like Alabama and Arizona before them. And as a result, migrant workers who go from Florida all the way up to New York State as this harvest season moves are skipping over Georgia. Uh, this started last fall. As a result, a lot of crop crops were left in the ground to rot there. Farmers this year have planted fewer crops in anticipation of not being able to harvest them. So it's not like giving the job to a native-born person. It's the job ceases to exist because the production's not going to be there. Uh, yeah? Are you against like, a mandated minimum wage? Uh, because these immigrants were legal, and they'd be forced to pay, or forced to be paid a minimum wage while working these jobs that other people aren't going to do. So yes, I oppose the minimum wage for the same reasons I talked about yesterday when it comes to sweatshop jobs. Um, because immigrants are here illegally now, it does give them the option of not working, or not paying attention to the minimum wage laws. Uh, I suspect that they would conform to them if they could be here legally. Uh, but I suppose you'd always have the option of working illegally if you w yeah. wanted to, if that was what was necessary. Um, but I'm not, I wouldn't say legalizing immigrants is conditional on getting rid of the minimum wage. I'd say legalize immigrants and we'll deal with the minimum wage if we have to. Um, a lot of them, by the way, get paid by the piece. So when it comes to the farming, they pay them based on production. Um, so this then raises the question, though. Okay, so if the jobs wouldn't exist if the wages are high, does that mean that the immigrants are pushing down the wages of the native-born population. So this here is there's a uh, journal called the Journal of Economic Perspectives. Um, and it's, it's kind of weird. It's a journal economists use to talk to other economists, <laughs> um, which is true of all of our journals, except uh, the joke about an economist like is as you go through your career, you know more and more about less and less until you know absolutely everything about absolutely nothing. Um, so as like hyper-specialization kicks in, all of a sudden guys who are doing labor don't know what's going on in monetary. Guys who do monetary don't know what's going on in trade, whatever. Journal of Economic Perspectives is supposed to be like a survey journal where experts in each field kind of write up a summary of what's going on in their field intended for other economists who aren't narrow specialists in it. This is what their summation of immigration was. Despite the large popular belief that immigrants have a large adverse impact on the wages and employment opportunities of the native-born population, the literature on this question does not provide much support for the conclusion. Hmm. Well, why not? Isn't it simple supply and demand mustn't push, mustn't push wages down? 
So actually, I was accused of that once. By the way, there's nothing better for I get hate mail for lots of things, but nothing gets me more hate mail than when I write on immigration. Um, and I did one piece for the Independent Institute years ago. Um, and I had this guy write me a kind of nasty email. And I got home late at night and got it in action. I had a few cocktails. And usually, I just delete hate mail. But this time, I kind of gave him a wise-ass response. Um, and then he wrote me back more reasonable after that. And we continued to go back and forth debating for a while. And what it amounted to is basically he had taken one economics course somewhere along the line. And he said, this is just violating supply and demand. I don't respect the laws of supply and demand, uh, which is a kind of odd thing to accuse an economist of. Um, so I directed him to various sources of why this might be true. And he uh, asked me, could I post my entire correspondence with you onto my website that is an immigration website? I had to go back and look at the first email in particular uh, and make sure that everything was OK. I'm like, OK, as long as you don't edit a word, you publish all of it up there. And here's this one paragraph that I want you to put in word for word at the end, directing people to the sources where they can see what my argument's based on. Uh, and he was going to call it, Economist Denies the Law of Supply and Demand. Uh, but he changed it because he actually looked at the sources and it became, Economics Profession Denies the Laws of Supply and Demand. Uh, <laughs> it's also the only time I've been featured on a neo-Nazi website. Um, but, but because it was a hatchet job, I kind of liked it. Um, so what he's saying, though, is this. It's just simple supply and demand economics, right? If we increase immigrants, it's an increase in the supply of labor. So from this, he was OK on the not, creating, not taking jobs on that. We increase the number of jobs. But it's got to push wages down, doesn't it? But yet, when economists study this, we don't find it. Where do we find The only way we find it is if you look at just high school dropouts in the United States. For them, depending on the study, you get some negative effect on their wages. Some studies find zero. Actually, some find a slight positive. But the worst, that those would be like Borjas ones, finds about negative 8% on high school dropouts. But no general effect on it. Why? Isn't the guy right? It's supply and demand. I must not get it. Well, one issue that we've already kind of talked about is, do the immigrants just come here and work and demand nothing in return? No. no. They demand goods and services as well, right? So if immigrants consume goods and services when they're there, someone's got to provide them. If someone has to create goods and services for them, someone has to employ people to do it. So the demand for labor doesn't just stay where it is either. The demand for labor has got to increase too. Now it becomes an empirical question. Does it increase? exactly equal, so wages stay un unchanged? Does it increase more, so wages go up? Or does it increase less, and wages go down? It's not clear ahead of time what it is, but it does mean it's not just a simple case of shifting the supply curve, therefore wages must go down. It's indeterminate whether wages go up or down now, because it depends how much goods and services the immigrants demand once they're here. That's part of it. The next is, is there such a thing as the supply of labor that immigrants are proud of? What's that? Oh, I was going to say there's many supplies of labor. There's many supplies. There's different skill sets, yeah. right? So like an immigrant doesn't have the same skills as someone who was born here domestically, so necessarily. Like, um, somebody, even in between immigrants, there might be somebody who works on a farm, or somebody who works in a restaurant, or whatever. Or someone who's a PhD. Yeah, th there's lots of um, very um, high-skilled immigrants. Yeah, so if we're thinking of like the US labor force, and we were doing like High skill, low skilled, and then across the bottom is quantity. What we have probably is very few at the very peak of the highest skilled. Lots of people in the middle with like high school education, maybe some college, and very few that are lacking a high school diploma and have very few skills. Most of us would be somewhere in the middle. If, so it's kind of like a picture of a diamond. What would it look like for immigrants, though? Basically, you get lots of them that are low skill. You don't get as many in the middle. And you get lots of them that are high skill. It's more like an hourglass. So it's roughly 67% uh, of people in California here without a high school diploma are immigrants. Nationally, it's 42%. Uh, excuse me, nationally. Uh, it's just a third. 
So a lot of the people who are very low skilled are immigrants. Then when we look at the upper end, um, a large number of PhDs are actually immigrants. When you go to college, you'll find that out when you find all of your teachers are foreigners. Um, huge number of our PhDs from the United States are foreigners. It's telling us that it's not the supply of labor that's shifting. It's they're bringing in different skill sets than what we have. Well, if they have different skill sets than what we have, this frees us up to do the things that we're better suited to do. In fact, actually, it sounds a whole lot like what I was talking about trade and globalization before. Why do we trade with people? Because they have a lower cost of doing something than we do? Same thing's true with immigration. Immigration's just free trade and labor. And the case for it is not fundamentally different than free trade and goods and services. In fact, actually, free trade and labor helps get you better services because a lot of services can't be internationally traded. So um, actually, I'll give you an example for myself here. Uh, when I lived in California, I had a house down in San Jose, and it had a backyard that was like, you know, the size of that little corner of the stage or something. Um, and like the trees were all pushed up against the house. It was sloping. It was nasty. Uh, and I moved in, and I wanted to like flatten it out, put a nice patio in, put a grilling station and a bar out there. It would be an entertaining area. And, uh, I, had inter I think I had Home Depot or somebody give me an estimate. It was going to be like 12 grand or something to do it. And I was like, that's ridiculous. Um, like, I'll just do it myself. Uh, hindsight, I'm really glad I didn't because if I had shoveled out the backyard, I think I'd still be shoveling right now. Um, it was amazing how much dirt came out. Um, but uh, at the time, I got a contract to do some housing consulting. That was going to pay me a little bit of money. And somebody else recommended an immigrant um, who might do some of the work. And he came over and gave me an estimate that was like one-third the price of Home Depot. And I was like, oh, well, that's less than what it's going to pay. This consulting gig is going to pay me. It'll take about the same time. I'll do the housing thing and do economics. I'll hire him to do the patio. And the result then is, I would have got the patio either way, but am I the low-cost provider of doing the patio? No. He's the low-cost provider of doing the patio because he wasn't going to write a housing economics report. I could do that. So it freed me up to do what I'm better suited to do um, by him being here as an immigrant. It wasn't something I could trade for internationally. It's a service. You have to be on site to be able to do it. He had an immigrant crew who worked for him. I don't know whether they were legal or illegal. I didn't ask and frankly didn't care. Um, um, they didn't speak English, though. We, I, my little bit of broken Spanish uh, was about all we were doing. Um, but it's basically another part of specialization and division of labor. So because they have different skill sets, it allows us to specialize in the things that we're better at. Well, they specialize in the things that they're better at. It makes us all more productive. In fact, Adam Smith classic, specialization and division of labor, is limited by the extent of the market. When you have more people in a given place, the extent of the market is bigger. It's why in New York City, you have no problem finding whatever type of restaurant you want to find. If you go out to Modesto, your restaurant selection is probably not going to be quite so varied. Um, more people is great. So even with similar skills, just the specialization that you do that then makes you better at a given thing gets greater with more people around. So immigrants add to that. So these are all reasons why we don't see the wages go down. One, there's a shift in demand. Two, it's not the supply of labor. They're not substitutes for us. In large part, they're complements, things that make us more productive. Three, they extend the extent of the market, and that makes us wealthier as well. So all three of those are the reasons why we don't find the wages being pushed down, except for the high school dropouts. And in that case, the evidence is mixed. But I'd really say the answer isn't, therefore, we need to limit immigration. Actually, first of all, almost any policy that brings us net benefits, there's got to be somebody who's a loser from. Um, but I really think the implication should be, maybe we need to do a better job of delivering education in the United States so that they're not high school dropouts. And I don't mean just like funding education more. I mean like radically changing how the whole educational system works, maybe. Uh, it's more a problem of that than anything about immigrants. Um, another aspect, actually, Bring it back to my last lecture on sweatshops and before that globalization that I want us to talk about. Immigration is an effective form of foreign aid. So foreign aid, I mentioned, has a disastrous track record of trying to make countries develop. It's not clear how we can give them good institutions. But it is clear that when an immigrant comes here, they get the good institutions, and then they become more productive. The gains from a Haitian moving to the United States far outstrip anything even the most ambitious living wage, if it didn't have unemployment effects, could hope to accomplish in Haiti. Many factors greater productivity when they move here. Nothing about them physically changes. They didn't all of a sudden get smarter. What they did is they had better, pe better skilled people to interact with, more capital, more technology, and a better institutional environment. Now, some might complain, well, you know, Haiti's not developing when Haiti moves, Haitians move here. Who cares? 
we don't care about like a particular piece of land having GDP. Like no one runs around and be like, oh no, Antarctica doesn't have enough GDP. It's, it's penguins, no one cares. What they care about is like the humanity that's on a piece of land. So when the Haitian moves here, that is economic development for Haitians. It doesn't matter that the piece of land called Haiti isn't getting any wealthier. Um, I think it's one of the few things that the United States can clearly do for poorer people in the world that definitely will benefit them. Um, and actually also the evidence on this is when you look at the people leaving, it doesn't tend to make the countries that, where they left any poorer after the fact. So it's not like, oh, some Haitians got richer by moving here, but it screwed over the country that they left behind. Little evidence for that. Um, secondly, actually with them comes a different form of foreign aid afterwards, uh, remittances. So instead of government to government aid, people who migrate here, work here, a lot of them save money and send it home. That money that's going home is not going through the government, so it's going directly to the people who need it, so you got less corruption and less perverse incentives. Two, the person sending it is someone with some sort of special local knowledge of the situation there, and who actually has uh, personal ties to the people they're sending it to. And three, they get feedback mechanisms where they hear from other people in the community if it's just their, you know, their drunk brother-in-law spending all the money, or whether it's actually going to good use. Um, so it makes it a more effective form of foreign aid going back. Yeah? Um, the main argument that I hear about immigration, at least from who I talk to, mm -hmm. is uh, that if you have completely open immigration, then you'll just let uh, all the criminals from other nations uh, come in your country, and it'll be a safe haven for our criminals. OK. So let's start doing, uh, let's pick up with there. Let's start taking some of these other issues. So before I do, though, let's. Uh, what I've given you so far is what I'd call the basic economics of it. So it doesn't make our economy poor, doesn't steal our jobs on net, doesn't push down our wages. Is a pretty effective form of foreign aid for those who we let in. Questions on that part so far? Next, let's get to the hodgepodge of other issues that it can make things difficult. So crime is one of them. One, I think, first response is the vast majority of immigrants who come here aren't ones who come here and commit crimes. Beyond that, though, I think it's reasonable to say, well, why don't we make the offer to come here conditional? <laughs> You're free to come here as long as you don't become convicted, of, let's say, of a violent or property crime. So we get rid of victimless crimes. But if you rob somebody or commit a violent act against them, you get deported. Or for that matter, when we let you in, we check to see if you're a known criminal or terrorist. I think that's a reasonable thing to put a restriction on. Um, but anything over and beyond that, you'd have to prove that you don't belong here by coming here and committing a crime, then deport you. Um, one person said to me, well, would you deport US citizens who commit crimes? I'm like, well, we kind of lack an Australia or Georgia to send them to right now. <laughs> but in the, in the case of immigrants, you actually do have somewhere to send them back to. Um, it would seem to me to the extent that crime is a fee, uh, and for that matter, deport them and their whole family even maybe if you need to sell people on it. Well, that seems kind of lousy. It seems a whole lot less lousy to me than we won't let you in in the first place because you might be a criminal. Therefore, stay in the miserable place that you live. Um, so I think crime is a fine concern, uh, and I don't think we should be paying to incarcerate them here. But deport them then. Yeah? Wouldn't crime go down if you run the immigrants if you decide if, you, if that law actually was passed that legalized it if it was a commitment? Maybe. So, uh, crimes per immigrant would probably go down because they'd be able to, op well, actually by definition, things that they're if they're currently here illegally, they're committing, quote, crimes, but I'm not going to count those as crimes. Uh, let's count as crimes. So actually, somebody remind me to get back to the rule of law at some point. Um, because they're able to operate in legal markets, there'd probably be less need to resort to crimes. But presumably also the quantity of in immigrants would increase greatly, so whether on net total crimes increased or decreased, I don't have a position on. But what I'd say is, as they increase, you just get rid of the people who did it. Um, with cr w I'm sorry, go ahead. That would be an effective deterrent against crime, would it? Presumably, it would be a pretty good deterrent. <coughs> Maybe a much better one than saying, hey, we'll pay for you to have meals and go sit in a cell. Um, along with crime, the concern is terrorists. What about terrorists who get in? Well, a few things. One, the terrorists who did 9-11 were able to get in <laughs> under current immigration restrictions. Two. Right now, actually, I don't know the current number. It had previously been around a million and a half illegal border attempt crossings per year. Um, it might have gone down while we're in the recession right now. But the vast majority of people trying to cross into the United States illegally are people who aren't terrorists or criminals who just want to work here. But that means if you are a terrorist or criminal and you can't get through a known checkpoint, 
you've got a lot of people to hide among while you're trying to cross the border. If you let people in legally, let's say through legal checkpoints though, the only people left crossing in the desert would be criminals and terrorists. Presumably a given amount of enforcement effort would be better at detecting them then than when they have a whole bunch of workers to hide among. Um, so while I think it can be a concern, I think it's one that's better dealt with actually with more open borders than with restrictive ones, given that other people are trying to get in. Um, what about social services? So this is about the big one that people bring up a lot. Immigrants come here and they consume tax-funded health care, schools, other government services. A um, few things. For local communities, sometimes they can be a fiscal drain. So and a lot of that has to do with how taxes are split up between national and local levels. So you can find individual local communities who hospitals or schools become overburdened because of immigrants who aren't getting tax revenue in return. That's more a commentary on US fiscal policy than it is immigration per se, though. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences did a study on immigrants and taxes over their lifetime. It's a bit dated, though. Uh, what it found was immigrants pay more in taxes over their lifetime than they consume in services. But that was before a lot of the illegal immigration flow that's happened in the last decade. Um, so I'm not sure if that would still be true or not. Uh, it's at least plausible that they might consume more. And so, by the way, it's not true that illegals don't pay, illegal immigrants don't pay taxes. Uh, a lot of them do. There's something called ITINs, Individual Taxpayer Identification Numbers for people who can't have a social security number. Uh, and most people who have an ITIN are someone who's here illegally and they pay taxes through it precisely in the hope that someday the U.S. government's going to uh, give some form of amnesty and they're going to look at who is paying taxes as who can be first in line. Um, it's also the case that immigrants pay taxes indirectly. So not just what they directly pay, but if, they, if a job is created that wouldn't otherwise exist and the employer is actually a legal business, that business pays taxes. And presumably because the employee is creating value in the firm, the firm is making profits that the business pays taxes on. They also consume goods and services that they pay sales taxes on. So the idea that like immigrants don't pay taxes is just nuts. Uh, but it's at least plausible that in some cases, or in many cases, they might be able to consume more in tax-funded services than what they provide in taxes. So this is Milton Friedman's classic example. He said, it's just obvious open immigration in a welfare state are incompatible. I think he's right, but I think that's a verdict of so much the worse for the welfare state rather than immigration then. Uh, all too often, people who are otherwise free market take from that, therefore we need to limit immigration until we get rid of the welfare state. To me, this is a very odd way for free market people to run on this. It actually seems to me that like some of you have encountered the readings of Ludwig von Mises before. It's doing the opposite of what, the, of what his dynamics of interventionism, right? They're saying, well, we have one intervention. Now we need another intervention to deal with that. Free market guys should be saying we should be pulling back the intervention that we have that's messed up, not creating extra interventions because of it. Um, so are, are you saying that we should just have like free, open immigration that anyone can just come, or that we should definitely like screen and make it easier for aliens to come in and become legal? Um, come back to that in five minutes, ten okay. minutes, OK? Because I want to because that relates to what the optimal number is. Yeah. Back to the welfare state and immigration being incompatible, wouldn't it uh, be better just to have sitting, we have our border, border states like um, presumably we want, and then we notice that, OK, welfare isn't working. Let's get rid of it. And that would be a more of a signal to get rid of welfare. Yeah, so I think it will be a drain. It could be could be a drain on the welfare state, and then it would put pressure to get rid of it. And actually, for that matter, just as we look across countries, countries with bigger welfare states have more homogeneous populations, because voters are more willing to subsidize people who are like them. The more heterogeneous the population, generally the smaller the welfare state, because the more people resent paying to somebody else. So I think culturally, there'd be a shift that would put political pressure, independent of any economic pressure, I think culturally, there'd be something that puts pressure to limit it more. I'd view this as a good thing myself. In fact, I debated, I've debated a lot of people on immigration. I debated the former governor of Colorado one time. And I think his basic opposition to immigration is he knows socialized health care won't work very well if lots of people can come here. Um, so he's like understanding this incompatibility between the two. And therefore, he, a liberal person, is against immigration. Um, it's not clear to me, though, that in all cases, so most immigrants who come here are of working age. Social Security is quickly going bankrupt. More immigrants coming in. Is, I mean, Social Security is a Ponzi scheme. It depends on getting more people in than what we were in it before to pay out the existing people. There is no, quote, savings. The trust fund is a fiction. Uh, it's one pocket paying the other. 
So actually a bad aspect in my mind of immigration is that it would make Social Security more sustainable for longer um, because most of the workers who come in, most people who migrate are workers. Um, I do think it's a valid point though that with a welfare state, or for that matter just government financed benefits for people, um, it does lead to any inefficient decision making. Um, although, it, to me, if, if your objection to immigration is that they might come here and consume social services, I do think there's an inconsistency for most people. So, for, play with me here for a second. Let's say I have a cousin in Ireland and I want him to come here. I invite him over. You say, oh, no, 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 he can't come because he might become a burden on the welfare state, so we don't want the immigrant to come. Okay. My wife and I want to birth another baby. Can I do that without your permission? Almost everybody in America will say you should be free to decide if you want to have a child or not have a child. But I'm birthing him into your welfare state. So I'm putting a burden on everybody else. In fact, I can guarantee, I got a little boy right now, I can guarantee he's two and a half, so for at least the next 15 and a half years, he's going to be a net burden on the state. The cousin from Ireland who's already an adult, what's the likelihood they're going to be the net burden for 15 years? A whole lot less. So if your objection is spillover costs via welfare state, if that's your objection to immigration, it should count for creating new people as much as bringing a person here. So you should be for population control. Given that most people aren't for population control, I don't think that they should be against immigration, at least because of the welfare state. But few are willing to be consistent on that. Um, all right, so let's get to this optimal quantity bit a little bit and spillovers. So what's the optimal quantity of immigrants from, actually, I've done this. I moved from California to Massachusetts. What's the optimal quantity of people to move from California to Massachusetts? We don't know, right? Actually. What's the optimal quantity of shoes to produce? We don't know for the same reason the Soviet Union didn't know. We need a market to figure these things out, right? Do you observe supply, demand, watch price bidding? You figure out how many shoes of what color to make. Well, same is true in labor markets. So how do we figure it out between Massachusetts and California? We let employers make offers of employment in one place. You judge what it's going to cost you to live in one place. Then you decide whether it's worth moving or not. It leads us to roughly the optimal flow of migration between California and Massachusetts. There are welfare states in both of them, and there's differences in their welfare state, but it's probably not dramatic enough to affect people's uh, migration decisions too much. So it's roughly optimal. Okay, well what's the optimal quantity of immigrants to come in then? So should it just be open borders, everybody can come in? Some people, I don't know the optimal number of immigrants. I know we don't have it right now, but I don't know what the optimal quantity is. Nobody does. What we need is a market to figure it out. That means, internalizing the costs and benefits of as many things as possible, and then allowing freedom to move. Would too many people come here with complete open borders right now? Yes, because there's dramatic welfare state differences between where they are and where we are. So that would give you more than the optimum. What I'd agitate for is let as many come in as we can, and then push to reform that welfare state, and once you do, we'll get roughly the optimal quantity. Some people say, we're running out of room in the United States. I just always kind of laugh if they've ever gotten in an airplane and flown across the country, they know that's not true. <laughs> um, there's plenty of room for them. And what will stop them from coming? When they don't think there's a market demand here for their labor, or when the cost of their living gets too high to make it worth coming here, then they'll stop. Then we'll have optimal migration flows. But we need a market to figure it out. Who would I exclude from it? Like I said before, criminals and known terrorists, and I suppose if you have an obvious contagious disease that's gonna you know, infect the population. But other than that, anybody who wants to, same way as California to Massachusetts, because I don't presume to know ahead of time who should be here and who shouldn't. We need a market to figure it out. Um, so then the question is, if we think that's an optimal policy in terms of economic efficiency, what do you do with what we have right now? You've got a whole bunch of people who are illegally in the United States. Some people will say, what part of illegal don't you understand? And I usually say something like, what part of should it be illegal don't you understand? <laughs> um, then they'll say, it's the rule of law. We must respect the rule of law. So one, the rule of law doesn't mean respecting whatever laws happen to exist at a given moment. The rule of law is an abstract set of principles about what the law should be and how it should operate. Uh, and when an existing law is inconsistent with the rule of law, I think it's actually optimal to ignore such a law. 
uh, both for justice reasons and for efficiency reasons. I mean, if you were in Nazi Germany and you were hiding a Jew in your attic, I don't think you'd say, well, it's the rule of law, I should turn him in. <laughs> but say, no, you're doing the right thing and the law doesn't correspond to justice. I feel the same way about people who are il here illegally. It shouldn't be illegal for them to associate and come here. Uh, as a result, I think the optimal reform should be to allow for them to be here, legalize them. In fact, it's actually one of the few, if most, some people say it's not the legal immigrants that are the problem, it's the illegal immigrants. It's because they're here illegally. I'm like, there's a magic wand solution. There's very few things in this world that there's a magic wand solution for. All you have to do is say, you're now legal. <laughs> so yeah. They came here illegally. Okay, what was so bad about them coming here illegally? They wanted to work. They wanted to be near family members. Where was, the, where was the actual crime? The crime was violating a statute that shouldn't exist. Wand. Problem solved. Um, this is not to say that there aren't other problems with immigration that you could be concerned with. So I think a valid concern would be the United States is good because of the quality of its institutions, which are a product of our history and the culture here. Having lots of immigrants come in might actually undermine those institutions and then make us worse in the long run. I think that's a valid concern. Um, I think it doesn't jive with how most immigrants through history have voted. Most immigrants groups have been discriminated against by people who are already here using the government, and as a result, they became more anti-government than the existing population. Uh, that's certainly the case during most of the immigration in the 19th century to the United States. Um, it's less clear now which party is not the party of big government, so I'm not sure it's easy to identify it now. Uh, it's also the case that they've just left bad governments to get here. It's not clear that they want to take and say, hey, I left that bad government. Let me make the United States one like mine. Two, just because you can migrate here doesn't mean we have to offer citizenship and voting to them. In fact, I'm not really thrilled that there's 300 million people in this country who have rights to vote over things for me right now. I'm not particularly thrilled with expanding that pool. <laughs> but I would like to let them come here and live and work and trade with me if they'd like. Um, so maybe you don't extend the franchise to them. Or maybe you make your citizenship rules much tougher. Um, I don't really have a strong position on that. I do think it's also the case that even with doing that, though, it, that's not to say that immigrants won't have an influence on policy. Simply through informal cultural mechanisms, they will. Um, some people object for other cultural reasons. I have uh, one colleague who admits all of the economics of immigration, but then he's like, I don't want to have to push one for English. And I'm like, that's not really a sophisticated objection to immigration. He's like, but I don't. I'm like. OK, you're right, the language could change. But language is a spontaneous order. It's kind of odd to think that you can centrally plan language. Uh, for that matter, culture more generally. <laughs> These are spontaneous orders. Will immigration change the culture? Yes. Will culture change anyway? Yes. Can anybody plan it? No. <laughs> um, I think these are valid concerns. They're just concerns that I don't see good solutions to. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the nature of it. Uh, but it, to me, it's at least, it's not obvious that having more immigrants here would make them come and vote in a bigger, more intrusive state that would make us poorer. And I think the evidence on immigrant assimilation is they assimilate just as well as 19th century immigrants did. It's just they assimilate into the more welfare status culture that is the United States today rather than the individualist culture that was there 130 years ago. Uh, I think it's more a commentary on, on us than them. Um, so. I want to open this up for questions and different topics related to immigration, but uh, let me just kind of give a summary punchline here is. Um, if your objection to immigration was narrowly economic, you need to revise your position. So they're a benefit to our economy. They don't steal our jobs. They don't push down our wages. That stuff's fairly non-controversial among most economists. Actually, the Independent Institute circulated a nice letter on it a few years ago um, summarizing uh, what basically a guy like George Borjas should be able to agree to in circulating it for economists to sign on to. Um, I encourage you to check it out on their website if it's not already in your packet, like other things are magically in your packet that I don't know about. Um, after that, I think there are, are other issues that are of concern, but I think most of them are of secondary consequence and can be dealt with. Um, and that we should look, work towards internalizing as many of the costs and benefits as possible so that we will get the optimal quantity of immigrants. Um, but objections to immigration shouldn't be narrowly economic. It should come from somewhere else. Uh, so what other questions about immigration are related? Oh, actually, how about this too? The case for immigration is basically, or the case for free trade and labor 
isn't fundamentally different than the case for free trade in goods and services or capital. Um, and in fact, actually, if natural resources, capital, and goods and services were completely internationally mobile, then there'd be no need for free immigration. Because any th if three out of the four of those are perfectly mobile, they will, the, they'll adjust to the fourth one to get you optimal production. But by definition, the natural resources aren't mobile. Services often have to be provided on, on site. As a result, the case for free trade and labor is the same as the case for free trade and capital or free trade and goods and services. Um, it's odd to me how many people are in favor of free trade but then are anti-immigration because the economics behind them is pretty much the same. Um, questions related to immigration, any aspects of it from you guys? Comments? How do you account for something like the DREAM Act occurring? The DREAM Act, how do I account for it occurring? Well, like, what, what are we supposed to do about that, you know, state-sponsored taxpayer money? Um, so I think you should vote against extensions of the welfare state. Um, actually, I'm, yes, I think you should vote against, I don't participate, I personally don't do that, but uh, I support you voting against extensions of the welfare state, uh, but not against, so I'm fine also, and this I might differ from some other libertarian leading free market economists. Uh, if the offer of immigration is conditional here, I'm also okay with the U.S., if we can't get rid of the U.S. welfare state, of leaving it for native-born citizens and not extending it to immigrants, so discriminating between the two, if the result is that that gets you more open immigration. Um, so I don't, I'm okay with discrimination on the, base, on the basis of migration status if it gets us greater migration, because I think the bigger good, both in terms of economic efficiency and in just justice, is getting the immigration here. Um, so I'd support either shrinking the welfare state or certainly not encouraging it to grow, but at the same time, um, pushing for immigration without the extension of welfare state benefits to them. Because I think most immigrants don't come here for that anyway. They come here because they want to work. Other thoughts? Yes? Also, I just wanted to make a comment. When um, immigrants come here, many of them uh, go away from their families and then send money back, which uh, in turn uh, gives that family more money in their country to buy goods and services in that country, which uh, in turn creates a uh, a more strong, stronger economy in that country where they came from. Yeah, but it's not, and you're not saying this, but some people would take from this, and then, oh, but that's a net drain on us. <laughs> no, when they send the money there, it all makes its way back, either indirectly or indirectly through pushing exchange rates, so it creates still demand for U.S. products even when they send money home. Here, uh, let me do one thing, and then I'll come to, when do, what do we have left, 10 minutes? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, one issue that we haven't discussed, but it would be very easy to take from this that I'm like an advocate of immigrant rights or the right to immigrate. I'm actually not. Uh, I don't believe there's a right to immigrate. So we have private property and we should be able to exclude people from private property. Uh, so you don't have like a right to come walk across my land, neither does somebody who, from Mexico. Um, but I also believe we have freedom of association. So if we have justly held property, we should be able to rent it or sell it to anybody we want. Why does the government put a filter on who we're able to interact with. What if the person I want to rent or sell to lives in another country? Shouldn't I be free to? What if I just want to have them on my property as my guest? What if I want to have them on my property and pay them to do work for me while they're on my property? I think the rights that are being violated aren't the immigrants' rights to be here. I don't believe they have a right to be on a particular piece of property. I think the rights that are being violated are the rights of property owners in the United States who wish to associate with immigrants, either having them as guests, renting or selling to them, or employing them. Um, so I think we have a freedom of disassociation. We should be able to exclude people if we want. But we have a freedom of association. And right now, government policy is violating both of these. It violates our freedom of association by not allowing us to interact with immigrants the way some people would like to. It also violates the freedom of disassociation because of the way illegal immigrants come into the United States then. There's lots of people in the Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico borders that have legitimate fears and concerns that they don't like people who are trespassing on their land as they're trying to sneak into the United States. These people's property rights are being violated for their freedom of disassociation. Uh, I think the answer to this is greater legal means so you don't violate that, so people come in, and I'll admit that government-owned streets and parks and stuff are a problem, uh, but I don't take from that as some, I think, mistaken libertarians do. Therefore, we should use the government to exclude immigrants from our public places. I think that's a greater violation of the rights of the people who want to associate with them on their private property. 
So I just wanted to clarify that this wasn't like an immigrant rights speech. I think the rights are with the existing property owners in the United States um, that are really being violated. I'm sorry, that was a little. Yeah, I was just going to say that is Mexico's economy uh, based on like 50% of American money being sent back from their family in America? Uh, I don't know, but I suspect not. I suspect that's a high number. Um, um, remittances generally, though, are a big source to a number of countries of wealth that comes in. 50 percent's got to be way too big for Mexico, though, because they have much more of an economy. Uh, some small African countries, you're more likely to get something on that on that level. No other thoughts on immigration. I actually, left more time on this one on purpose because I thought there'd be more. Yeah. I remember in the Republican debates a few months ago, they were talking about um, the lines and stuff for the, um, the immigrants coming into America and the fact that you already have Im illegal Im immigrants in the country. So how do you deal with the fact that um, the people waiting in line to be citizens are taking yeah, I get it. So how is the fairness issue dealt with if there's people who have been obeying the current rules and waiting while there's other people aren't here? Isn't it unfair to just legalize them? Uh, maybe, but let's also be realistic. With the current number of illegal immigrants in the United States, there's no way you're going to deport them all and send them back to their countries. Like, just realism of trying to do that and the political backlash, and I don't mean voting, but just uh, cultural backlash that the government would get if they ever tried to enforce that ain't going to happen. So we have to come up with some solution for it. And it would seem like legalizing them who are here and not causing trouble is the easiest way to deal with that. Now, the way I deal with the fairness part is after you legalize the ones who are here, or at the same moment you legalize the ones that are here, you let everybody who's on the list come in too. So if they want to come in, come. So is it fair? Eh. Why should they get to come here first? Whatever. At least we're not delaying that. At least we're not saying, OK, legalize the people who are here. You people keep waiting. Say, legalize people here, and come on in. OK, so um, I have um, about two things to say. One is a question, one is a comment. Huh? First, the question is, um, uh, how would you go about, I have lots of uh, friends and family who are against immigration. How would you go about uh, convincing them that immigration is uh, something that is good rather than detrimental to the economy. Like, what type of statistics should I show them? Do you have any good sources on that? It depends what their objections are. So how I usually start with people is, oh, why aren't you in favor of immigration? And I let them tell me their reasons. And then I kind of go point by point with them. I suspect that at the end, there's some people who really have a more base objection to immigration that they don't want to articulate. And after you smash the reasons that they gave you, they still just like, eh, I don't know about it. Um, but so what I do, so actually when it comes to the economic stuff, you can get this out of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, just plot total civilian population and total civilian employment. There's no effect on jobs. It's a really easy picture to show and just be like, this is freaking nuts. Uh, and then explain like the Bastiat, seen and unseen. It's like it's a perception bias that you get with the news. Um, the wages stuff is a little bit less obvious, although I like the kind of diamond and hourglass thing. Most people tend to get that fairly quickly. Um, and your comment? Um, I also wanted to mention how obscene the list is to get into the United States from other countries. It's really hard to get in. I have a friend, um, well, it's really my dad's friend. He, was a, he immigrated from Russia legally, and it took him uh, 15 years and thousands of dollars to uh, get to the top of the list. To oh, yeah, it's ridiculous. And so beyond that, for people who are here Ill who are here legally but are, are immigrants and trying to deal with this, I deal with it in my role as we have a PhD program at Suffolk University. And so I graduate students there, and a lot of them are foreign, who are then trying to get jobs in the United States. And I had one last year who I, we got a postdoc for at the University of Minnesota. I was all stoked for him. He did all his paperwork, check, shows up at Minnesota, and they decide, oh, no, you actually have to go back to Russia and get new paperwork and new visas. And like, he spent the first like month and a half of his fellowship back in Moscow trying to get his paperwork together. This is a guy, he's a PhD economist who's never done anything wrong. He's been here as a student for a year. Like, this is just, talk about dead weight cost. Yeah. Dead weight cost all around with that stuff. I had two others this year who were on the job market together who were also dealing with drama over that as well. It makes me nuts. 
Um, yeah. So like in your system, say I live in Mexico and I'm a Mexican citizen and I want to come to America, I should just be free to come and then I pass the screen test, make sure I'm not a, a criminal, I'm not a terrorist, and I'm welcome to work. Mm -hmm. Great. That's it. Easy. Nothing else. Yeah, we don't need a big immigration services department to do this. So you don't think that we should be you know, putting people on the waiting list for seven years? We should just abolish that? Yeah, I'd get rid of it. So, okay, so my optimal would be open borders. Easy, and I don't mean open like willy-nilly just jump across. Let's, fine, you can have legal checkpoints so we can check, hey, is he a terrorist, criminal, or diseased? After that, let him in. Uh, if I couldn't have my policy, what would be like some second best ones? Well, anything that increases quantity is gonna be better for us right now. So any marginal relaxation is good, uh, including, I think, some version of amnesty for the people who are here. Uh, some people have proposed, and I'm not necessarily against actually another senior fellow at Independent, I've heard talk about this before, of if we're just going to have a bigger quantitative one, and he's working on, okay, what do you think is politically possible right now? He's like, let's go back, what was the highest uh, immigration as a percent of our population, which I think was in the 19 teens at one point. Uh, he's like, let's take that percent of the population, that's how many slots we'll have open every year for people to come in. Uh, but then instead of these crazy quota systems and stuff of the bureaucracy you deal with it, it'll just be a stock market for it. There's whatever that number is, if it means there's, uh, you know, a million spots in a year, okay, there's an auction for the million spots. And the people can pay it for it themselves to get in if they want, or if you have family members here or whatever who want to buy it for somebody, or if you want to create a charity that buys spots to give to poorer people in distressed regions, whatever. It's like auction them that way, because that way they are, it's the people who value being here most highly that get the spots. Um, I think that would be a reasonable step in the right direction because I'm not realistic about open borders becoming the reality anytime soon. Uh, I do think amnesty will become the reality at some point soon because they're just going to have to deal with it. But I think each administration wants to kick it down the road and not deal with it to the extent they can. Yeah? You were talking about not allowing, or you didn't really have a firm stance on it, you said, but not allowing immigrants to vote because of supposedly changing you know, fundamentalism of our country or whatever. So at what point do you think that they should be allowed to vote? Owning property or, or uh, what? Should seek them being uh, I don't have a firm position of yeah. where that would be. I mean, I'm not thrilled with the idea that anybody can vote on right. public policies that affect me, yeah, exactly. whether they're native-born or foreign-born, given what we let our governments do. So I mean, in my optimal world, they wouldn't have the right to vote on anything that would affect my life. <laughs> uh, but where <laughs> that's far removed from just dealing with immigration yeah. today. <laughs> uh, all right, guys. Well, thanks for all this. And I think it's time for our, our discussion groups. Yep. All right.